Hey everybody, Pete A. Trigger, executive producer and host of your Break It Down show with our episode today featuring a friend coming back again, Evan Sayat. And you know if Evan is here, that means Eric Kleinsmith, my former commander from Bosnia, a spy master of spy masters. And these, the three of us are going to have a conversation about Evan's latest book called The Woke Supremacy. And basically it's his anti-socialist manifesto. And he talks about the problem with the supremacist nature of woke ideology. And I think there's some real important factors here. He examines the historical aspects, where we've been, why we're at where we're now, and maybe where we're going. All of those things are important. But also just in general, just to kind of hold ourselves accountable as a body, as a population, so we can understand, you know, know each other better and you got to do things like you know, listen to evan and see what he has to say and listen to the other side too so i think you'll appreciate this evan's always entertaining always smart always intelligent and i think you're going to dig his style uh one other thing i want to say to you guys is that save the brave we continue to fight ptsd and veteran suicide a great way to help us is by going to save the click on that donate tab put a one time or a recurring or do both Donations. It is getting to be the giving season, the busiest time of year for donations, and it's always a good time to give to Save the Brave. We will put that money to work and we'll help save veteran lives. All right. Enough about that stuff. Enough about Eric. Enough about Evan. Enough about old Pedro. Here comes your man, Evan Sayet. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Cope. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Evan Sayet, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, it's uh, it's your old friend Pete A. Turner, executive producer and host of the Break It Down Show, with uh, my former commander from Bosnia, Eric Kleinsmith, who said, "Hey, let's have Evan back on the show because he's had a book." Eric, why don't you introduce who Evan is and how you know him? Sure, uh, I, Evan. How long have I known you now? Ten, ten years. Well, I, I, it's got to be approaching ten years. Yeah, uh, more yeah. than that. More than that. I'll tell you why. I gave my famous speech in two thousand and seven, and that's, that's when right. you reached out to me. So it was soon right. after. Right. So to Evan, if you if you don't know a quick background, is he he kind of burst on a national spit stage with a presentation he gave to the Heritage Foundation in 2007. And it's uh, I think it's you can find still find it on YouTube. It's got I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of views, but it's just it's it's it was just gave a talk on how the modern liberal thinks. And so what I did is I as I was listening to that, I was in the middle of working on an analytical course for the for, you know, for the army of all folks. Um, uh, counterterrorism analysis course. So I was using a lot of modeling on, uh, you know, human assets, modeling on groups, uh, pro threat profiling, that, that that kind of stuff. And what caught me was that the things that Evan was saying was you had the ability to, you know, it, it, it caught me as kind of one of the rules that you had to have for good analysis. And one is it had to be usable. You had to be able to apply what he was saying. You had to be able to apply. You just can't talk in theory, and then not have it work anywhere. It actually had to be, you know, you had to take a particular scenario or a situation or a topic like, I don't know, just throw out like climate change or gun control or whatever is a hot political topic. You, you have to be able to take his theories and apply it and they have to work. But on, conversely, they also have to be repeatable and they have to work. And when, when I came up with them, I was like, as, as I told him, I was like, there is a, there is a way that you can model uh, how ideology is used as a lens to view and make decisions off a particular topic. So now he's talking specifically uh, on the liberal side or, or what's what we're now really deeming not even liberal anymore as, as you're talking more socialism. Um, and, and that can be, you can use that as, as a model to, for different uh, topics, but in order for that to work, you have to then take uh, that same model and apply it toward conservative thought or libertarian thought or, you know, anything in between that model, that analytical model still has to work if you're going to use it for predictive methodology. And, and lo and behold, as I was playing around with it, it, it started to work. And so I started applying that to my, the, the lesson plans I was putting together when I was looking at 
uh, terrorist motivations, goals, and objectives. What you know, who becomes a terrorist, and why? What are some of the driving factors? So you're going to apply national separatism. You're going to apply um, the you know the same uh, socialist models, and, and then you're going to apply something like Islamic fundamentalism, or um, you, you know, for some domestic terrorists like um, Timothy McVeigh or something like that, you're going to apply some very uh, independent anti-government anarchists or even um, uh, uh, what the heck, just some uh, more more conservative or Christian fundamentalist things, and and it had to work. And lo and behold, the things that a Evan was saying did work uh, for both. And so that's why I, I looked at that as a sound methodology, and I used that on, and as I was developing um, my thoughts on threat profiling, which made it into my book. Uh, so that's why I reached out to Evan, just said, you know, hey, you 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 know, you're on something here. You may not know it, but th there is some science behind your madness, and that you know there is some ap applicability uh, across the you board. You know what? I, what I what I didn't know, Eric, was that there was madness behind my science. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> However you want to put it, you know, you can put the white lab coat on and say a couple more ha ha ha's as you're doing that. But yeah, it's all good. <laughs> so, so Evan, you're back but, to discuss your. Oh, I'm sorry. Did, did you have more to say? No, but yeah, I was just gonna say. But we've been so we got together. We, we met first at, at at a CPAC convention, which was in in DC every year, and we've been getting together ever since. We've done some uh, other things since then. We've just been keeping in touch here and there. And what, when uh, when he was working on this his, his most recent book, he, he asked me to take a look at it before it came out. So we went back and forth with some constructive criticism and. Well, uh, now it's in print and ready to sell and, you know, a fantastic read. One, one, one of my favorite moments is the first time that uh, Eric and I did get together at CPAC. We met downstairs in the restaurant and then I, I took him upstairs to where the uh, uh, speakers are and where the trap radio row is and whatnot. And at the end of it, he turned to me and he said, my God, you're the Yoda of CPAC. <laughs> 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 Always a compliment, Andrew Good with the sword. Yeah. So you're here today to discuss your new book, Woke Supremacy. Give us an, like a primer on what, what it is about and uh, why folks should buy it. By the way, the link for it is right here in the, uh, if you're watching live, it's right here. And if not, it'll be in the show notes if you're listening. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, for, first of all, just so your audience knows me a little bit better, I am not necessarily an author. I say that I'm in the conservative thought industry. Uh, and that's always been both a blessing and a curse in that I, I put my thoughts out there in a, in a variety of ways, whether it's as an author or as a columnist or as a lecturer. I also write for other people. I've written two speeches for the president of the United States, Donald Trump. Uh, I'm also a political comedian. And so there are all these different ways that I can put my thoughts out there. My least favorite is to write a book. It's a daunting task. It's a lonely task. Uh, um, it, it, it just because it's so long between when the idea occurs to you and when you actually get some some of the joy of having it come to fruition. You know, if you write a joke, you can perform it that night. If you write an article, you can see it the next day. But but a book, nonetheless, I'm sitting home and I'm watching the riots break out and I'm listening to the pundits and I'm listening to the politicians and I'm listening even to the participants. And none of them seem to know who the woke are where they came from, what they want, what they're willing to do to get it. And most frightening of all, Pete, what is likely to befall humanity if somehow they were likely to win? And look, I'm, I'm going to tell you guys, this is kind of embarrassing to be saying it to you guys, but the first rule of warfare is to know thy enemy. And it was very clear to me that nobody else had done it. Somehow this knowledge had not been provided to the professionals, even to the participants. And so I took it upon myself to, to do what I did the first time with um, the kindergarten of Eden, how the modern liberal thinks, the, the talk in the book that Eric was referring to, which is in a very basic, in a primer form, lay out just what the moral issue is what that other side believes which we just didn't have in our arsenal and so i did it i wrote it in short uh, it's only i think 150 pages you know i looked at uh, a, a other books like like thomas Paine's common sense uh and recognized that it was bite size and it was un uh, you know unrelenting and, un and un unapologetic and that was the format and the form that i took with this book 
because I do believe this is coming to, to a head. I do believe this is coming to war, whatever that war may look like. When you talk about this on other shows, I was doing some research, You and you did this last time on the show too, you don't just look in the here and the now, you look back in time and you talk about the Weather Underground and all these different organizations that the, Eric and I know about because of our work you know, in counterintelligence and everything. You have to understand the genesis of these things. But um, why did you even know about this stuff? Why do you know about these early, you know, late 20th century groups that were fomenting violence and uh, political <clears throat> upheaval? You know, this has been true my entire life, Pete, but I know things I have no right to know. Uh, I, I really I really couldn't tell you. I mean, look, I was born in the 60s, came of age in the 70s, did a two hour documentary for the Discovery Channel on the 1970s. Uh, I've always been intrigued by the 60s and how it is portrayed and how it really wasn't. Uh, and, and, and so it, it's not like it was a great deal of research, although obviously I researched in, 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 in order to support the things I thought I knew when in fact did. Um, but nonetheless, it was always just part of uh, the DNA of, of, of what I know. Why the term woke supremacy? Well, the woke is, is simply what uh, they call themselves and what I've called them to differentiate them from liberals, which is what they're sometimes inappropriately called, uh, progressives, which they're sometimes inappropriately called. Uh, last time through, because when I first gave that talk 13 years ago and then wrote the book, I think it's closer to six or seven years ago, it hadn't quite yet uh, metastasized in, into what it is today. So I called them the modern liberal back then, the, the uh, modifier modern, to make sure it was clear that they weren't, in fact, liberal. But now they've taken the name and, and it's really it, it, it's the worst of the worst of what I wrote about in, in the original book. You know, what, what happened was, at least back then, when I gave that original talk, there were still some influences from the last of the great generations. But as the years progressed since then, and either through natural attrition or Soviet style uh, purging, there is no longer any connection to the great values that made America great. It's now subsequent generations having been raised by the original democratic socialists, the radicals, who, who have now been so steeped in the narratives and the orthodoxies of radicalism that they don't even know the values they, they, uh, of, of, of what made America great. Why, you know, can, let me tell you, actually, let me go on. Why is supremacy? Because it's actually a supremacist movement. In fact, that's one of the most essential points I make in, in, in my work is that socialism isn't an ideology. Right. Socialism is an economic model. It's a global uh, governing structure that any number of ideologies have uh, glommed onto in the past. You know, Marxism isn't Leninism. Leninism isn't Stalinism. Stalinism isn't Maoism. Maoism isn't Hitlerism. And Hitlerism isn't democratic socialism. Those are all the various um, ideologies that have then used the, the, the economic model and the, and the government structure of socialism. And no matter whether it was Leninism, Stalinism, Maoism, Marxism, Hitlerism, or Ocasio-Cortezism, it's a supremacist ideology. And what I, as I, you know, it's always, you're always leery to use Hitler in any of these things, but he's just one of the many that I refer to whose ideology is different, but whose system is the same. But at the same time, I point to the nicest socialist who has ever lived, John Lennon. Right. And, and by the way, Lenin was not a socialist. The protagonist of that song was a socialist. But you, 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 he wants all the world to live as one. That's his objective. That's the goal. That's the end game. That's the uh, uh, original uh, original purpose of his 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 plans. Right? Well, Hitler wanted the world to live as one. It was just a different one. Marx wanted the world to live as one, workers. It was just a different one. Even Islamic supremacism, Islamicism, wants the world to live as one. It's just a different one. And so 
we, we can have a disagreement. We can have a conversation about whether that one this time really is the supreme one. But let's understand that even the nicest socialist in the world is pushing forward a supremacist ideology, the woke supremacy. Yeah. Well, and, and you're, you're right. I, I often say that the whole BLM movement is flawed because it's racist at its core, you know, and, and all of these things have problems. You look at John Lennon, he's the nicest socialist ever, who also had no problem balling up his fist and punching his woman in the eye, eye you know, so we have these, these things. Yeah, but, 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 but that was Yoko. I mean, we can get behind yeah. that. <laughs> and, and let me say this dude we have all kinds of people on the show we cover the entire political spectrum that's not a problem we also have artists of all stripe on the show so you know evan gets to talk about his book and you know i think it's important to have all these conversations because we can take it and we can really understand more about who we all are by by hearing from a lot of different voices so just in general if people are tuning in understand that the point here is to hear out what evan has to say and ask good fair questions and, and move forward with it are you are you actually are you actually apologizing for me? Nope, nope. I'm just I'm okay. just stating it because oftentimes people will say something like to me like you only have such and such, and I'm like you know diversity is not a problem on this show. We have all kinds of people, but not everybody watches every show. One gotcha. one thing one thing that I would put is is you know when you see a lot of conservative authors, I mean before any election you're going to see just the book market is flooded with. Uh, and you can, you, you know, all kinds of different titles, both on the right and the left. And you can tell they're, they're specifically geared toward, you know, making that political bank because there's a title and then it says how somebody, somebody did this to somebody. Um, you, know, <laughs> you, know, how, you know, how Joe Biden destroyed you know, um, the black community or how Donald Trump ruined America. It's, it's, it, 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 they're all coming up. But what makes Evan's book stand out differently? And, you know, even though. It's it's not nece- it's not made for just one side or the other to read because you know if you you have a conservative author comes out I think like Sean Hannity might have a book come out well guess who's going to read that uh, other folks who are already ide- ideologically in line with that what what I would say for for your guests or anybody listening in is is check out the reason Evan's book is not going to throw in your face that you're evil because you're a leftist or you're stupid because you're a leftist, or there's some character flaw that you have because you're a leftist. What he does is he lays it out in, uh, quite frankly, very academic terms. And so I, I this, what, then the piece that keyed off on, that I keyed off on the most was I, you know, I have lots of friends that come from different political stripes, uh, whether they're, you know, I keep in touch with them through social media or whatever, but I do get questions asked. It's like, you know, sometimes it's just so confusing to understand climate change, or it's just so confusing to understand what, why we're arguing about this abortion issue or whatever it is. And what what Evan's book serves as is kind of lightning rod is, is to understand all of those other issues, you have to understand the underlying principle to that. And it's they're all based upon getting our society to a point where we are now under a socialist economic model. You know, when when... I first became a conservative and, and a conservative pundit because my history is in the entertainment industry. And, and, and my upbringing was New York City born liberal Jew who moves to Hollywood and is in the entertainment industry. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it, it was only post 9-11 that I became, began to become at, at first a reluctant Republican and then a Republican, but a reluctant conservative, then a reluctant conservative and, and now a very proud conservative, I I, I recognize there seem to be two kinds of authors, let's say, two kinds of pundits on on the conservative side. There were those who did an outstanding job of chronicling the wrongs of the left, but offered no philosophical background, no philosophical explanation. Just they did this, then they did this, then they did this, then they did this. Right, that's what I'm talking about. And, and, they were very accessible in their language and very popular. And, and Sean Hannity is a great example. And mm-hmm. Ann Coulter is another. And Michelle Malkin is another. And then mm-hmm. there were those who, who did uh, attempt to talk about philosophy and, and often did a great job of it. But they were inaccessible in their language. They were too right. academic. Right. Uh, Tom, uh, 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 Alan Bloom comes to mind, The Closing the American Mind, which I think is an absolutely brilliant and essential book. And I had to read every single every single paragraph two, three, four, five times. I'd say, this is gibberish. This is nonsense. This is, oh, now I get it. 
And right. so I tried to find that middle ground and it seemed to come naturally to me where, where I could discuss the philosophy, but do it in a more accessible language. Right. That's, that's why one of your hosts, Pete's uh, Victor Davis Hansen is excellent in that area that, that Evan talks about. Cause it, obviously this guy is, he knows world history. He knows antiquity better than, than almost any academic you could ever turn to. But then he can take those examples from 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, and bring those forward and show why those principles still apply today for your specific world. Evan is doing that so that it doesn't matter. It's like, why, you know, I don't, I want to understand, and I keep going back to the same, the same things. I need to understand the, the riots that are going on. I need to understand racism in America. I need to, if you want to understand all of those things, learn what what the tenets are of socialism and, and learn what the tenets are of capitalism and compare and contrast the two. And you'll immediately see that that's really the some of the underlining pieces to every single argument. Just like I say for terrorism, if you're going to understand terrorism, you must understand what have not a, a scholarly knowledge, but at least have a working knowledge of what Islamic fundamentalism is or what national separatism is, because that's before 9-11, 90% of the world's terrorists were national separatists. They were not Islamic fundamentalist terrorists, even the, the PLO and organizations like that. They, they were not. But Red Army Faction, Action Direct, all these leftist Bader Meinhof gang is, is the same thing. Uh, all these terrorist groups, they, they were specifically tied to leftist Marxist principles. What Evan is saying is that this is the center point or the center of gravity for all these different issues funnel back to that. And that's why, again, I go back to as a working model. It, it, he's showing that this model, if you can understand this one principle, the other pieces all then make sense as you and, attack. And, and, and that's why at the very, very beginning of the book, it's the most essential argument for the first half of the book is that socialism is not an ideology, which is why all those different terror groups that Eric was just naming, they didn't all share the same ideology. They didn't share what they what they shared was a, a system that they saw, a globalist system where their ideology right. would ultimately be the global ideology, the one that, that uh, John right. Lennon sings about. There's also something, and, and I don't know that I mentioned this in the book. I don't think that I, I, I ultimately did. But capitalism is a bit of a misnomer and people get tripped up over it yeah. because every system is capitalist. Every system has capital. It's mm -hmm. just a matter of who controls that capital. And right. once you've made that argument, I, I find it's easier for those on the other side uh, uh, to recognize, yeah, it, it's not capitalism. It's government structure and the structure of where that money and power resides. I was going to say that uh, words mean things, you know, and when we try to understand these things, there's a couple of funny things I think to note is um, one, like you said, there's different forms of socialism. There's different forms of democracy. You can easily, if you posted on Facebook, are we a democracy or a republic? That's all you'd have to do. Sit back and there'd be a thousand comments. And ultimately, if you want to get into etymology, they mean the same damn thing. The power is with the people. Um it's it's a little bit infuriating to me when people talk about from the left when they talk about utopia as a place when they're literally basing an entire philosophy politically whether it's an ideology or not on a piece of satire it's like Irma Bombeck wrote something and that's what you're thinking the world is going to be because Thomas More wrote a satirical piece it's the the main character his name literally means the purveyor of nonsense and utopia is really no place anyhow these right, are the things right. we if you take the time to learn this it the world becomes a lot more complex and not as cut and dry and it turns out that well, guys like one, orwell matter you know pe some people are more equal than others and, and orwell is all over my my book uh because one of the things that i constantly get when, when I compare democratic socialists to, to some of the uh, regimes that have been out there, you know, the killing fields of Mao and, and the gas chambers of Hitler and the gulags of Stalin, they say, but where, where are the gulags? Where are the gas chambers? Where are the, and, and, and the reality is twofold. One, none of these other socialist entities had these mass murdering machines until they took over the government. You know, you, you can't you can't have these kind of complex mass murdering apparatus if uh, you don't have the money and the power 
of, of, of government behind them. So the fact that today's socialists aren't yet committing the atrocities that these others have should not be all that reassuring. But the genius of, uh, of Orwell isn't found in his recognition of authoritarianism and totalitarianism within socialism. Everybody knew that right from the start. Even Marx wrote it into the perfect socialist society where he said, before we can have our workers' paradise, we first must have a dictatorship of the proletariat who will then be exactly what we're witnessing now. You know, the, the, these were just more primitive versions of the cancel culture. Orwell's genius came in recognizing right. the technology would be such that you would need gas chambers and, and killing fields and gulags any longer because they would have the technological ability to write code and cancel those of us who, who, who are the others, those of us who aren't the one. Right. And that's, that's where I take part of when, when you see the riots that are going on now, I take a little bit, not, not a dis issue, but I take a little bit of disagreement with anybody who says, well, these rioters are anarchists. And no, they're not. Um, they, they, they may have the symbology, they may have the, 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 the propaganda or whatever they're putting out for story, you know, all of the anarchy is, is a means to an end. And so it's, again, it's like I said, if you want to understand what's going on with the, with the motivations behind the rioters and, you know, even whether it's, whether it's Antifa or, um, gosh, you can, you know, again, you can even apply it to the proud boys or the, um, boogaloo boys or whatever it's, it's, it, it all goes back to depriving somebody of their right to make their own decision, having their own freedom of movement, freedom of will, and imposing your own system up upon them. Oh, Eric, so, yeah. I'm sorry. But uh, one, one thing that struck me all along was the seemingly odd bedfellows that, that you find in the socialist <laughs> revolution. Right. Um, and, and one of them being those who are anarchists, who you would think would be all the way on the other side of the political spectrum. Uh, I mean, right. communism right. is but, but they, they are aligned because they both recognize that whatever end they seek, the intermediary step has to be the destruction of the world as it is. Right. And, and, and the thing that, that, that struck me was how often the socialist entities of the past aligned mm. with the Islamic supremacists, even though right. their, their original purpose, their end game, the perfect world they sought, were diametrically opposed. So right. Hitler wanted a world without Semites, and yet he allied with with, with, with the Islamicists, with the Mufti right. of Jerusalem. All right. Right. Uh, Stalin claimed to want a world without religion, and yet the, the they were allied with the Islamicists who are religious fanatics. Today's democratic socialists claim to want a world where women and gays are, are equal citizens, and yet they are aligned with the Islamicists who throw gays off of buildings right. and subjugate women. Right? And the reason being what they share in common is before either one of them can get what they want, the first thing they need to do is destroy what is. Right. And that's, and that's your difference between uh, evolving or, or you know using evolution to change the society versus using revolution so for evolution you work within the with the current society's constraints and you go through you know the voting process and that kind of thing amending the constitution in our case but for the revolutionary process the current system must be destroyed and, and or, or it must be dismantled you know even in our own american revolution french revolution you know every revolution that's been around it, it, it's a revolution because you have to destroy that current structure and then rebuild on the ashes of on top of that and that's where you see again it goes uh, it goes back to the the underlying piece is you want you'll make friends with the anarchists but but they're not really anarchists they're just there to do the the i guess the shovel ready job of destroying the first yeah, destroying the first yeah. first part of the society so that you can rebuild on its ashes on top of them. I, I said that's funny because just five minutes before I came on the air with you, I had written exactly that. <laughs> <the> exact, <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah. <laughs> that's really scary. We had a guest on recently, a Harvard political scientist author, and his name is Yasha Monk. And his research shows that young people in particular are uh, accelerating their, their acceptance of totalitarianism. 
uh, whether it's here, Poland, all over the world, there's a growing acceptance for that. So um, what are your thoughts? I mean, why on earth would that be? Like, we've learned this lesson. I know we hate to learn from history, but we've learned this lesson already that totalitarianism is bad. Um, what's going on here, Evan? What is your what is your humorous comedian mind think about that? Well, I, I, I know that in America, there there isn't this kind of wide ranging, what we used to call a liberal lowercase l education. They're, they are really being brought up very much in in the way that uh, Lenin had his his young pioneers and Hitler had his Hitler youth and uh, and and the Islamists have their madrasas where they rock, rock back and forth all day and they've simply been raised so steeped in the narratives and the orthodoxies of the supremacy and so denied any alternate point of view i mean i say I, in the book i call it the one drop test where one drop of infidelity towards the, the, the supremacy is enough to see you uh, destroyed, canceled as, as, as you right. would be if, you, if there was one drop of disagreement with Hitler, if there was right. one drop of disagreement. And so they buy into the utopian vision. They buy into this notion that the government, <laughs> which is ironic because you know, they, they, they want the government because they don't trust the people, but in order for them to believe the government is better than the people, they have to believe that they are gods of some sort. And in fact, they do, which is why they're willing to totally give in to the authority of God. Hey, this is Pete A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. They're willing to totally give in to the authority of God. Fair enough. I was leaving space for <laughs> Eric. No, I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. So, well, what's he what's he supposed to say when I've answered everything? <laughs> exactly. Everything. All things have been answered. Well, I'll and just this here and drink. This goes again yeah. back to Thomas More, 500 years ago, and the guy who tells the story of Utopia. His name again means the purveyor of nonsense. Half the day, that's his name. So, so we have to have different spectrums, different political movement. Again, if we read our Greeks and no Aristotle and the politics and all that kind of thing, these things, again, give us a roadmap. You know, we've been down this. We know things trend one way or the other. So we can't stay on on an extremist path for too long. Uh, otherwise, things will change, whether it, it deconstructs into dystopia um, or, or something else happens. Another thing I know, and I'm sure Eric, you know, has experienced this too, stability in a country is exceptionally rare. Like it's just not easy to do to have as much diversity as we have, to have as much freedom as we have. How many how many regimes has France had over the two hundred and sixty years or however long it's been that we've had one? Right. Right. Yeah. And that's that's where I get the, the, the argument against American exceptionalism is this, that, you know, our constitution is really no different than, than any other con government. It's like name a, a current government that, yeah, we are a very young country compared to the rest of the world. Name a, a government that is older than ours. Right. There's a handful. Nope. I think one of them is, is UK and they still had a revolution of their, you know, or, or an English civil war of their own in the 1640s. Since they also, you know, our own name one. They also went from a monarchy to where the monarchy is is really just for show. I mean, there there was a complete right. change. It was a right. peaceful ish revolution, but it was nonetheless a a, 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 a gigantic change of government style. Right. Ours right. hasn't been two hundred x number of years. How many years has right. it been? Right. Yeah, we've had some again, amendments. We built, yeah, we built in. Yeah, we built in the amendment process to. To change that, and so when you pass something like the 18th Amendment, you know, for prohibition, you can go back with the 21st, and say, ah, that was a mistake, you know. But again, yep. you're, we were able to do that peacefully. Not a, not, you know, very few other countries can say that they are, have an older existing government than ours, and some of them are changing on a yearly basis, rewriting their constitution all the time. That's that's a big, you know, I have a big problem with that because now you're no longer being ruled by uh, the rule of law. You're being you're being governed by men and the whims of right. men. But who, whoever, whoever wrote the last constitution, whoever had the right. power to write the last constitution, exactly. Is, you know, one one thing that I find it's it's rather subtle, but 
I think it's important is that while the left promises utopia, we never, we being conservatives, we being <laughs> on the right, don't promise utopia. Uh, when we say America is exceptional, we don't say it's perfect. Right. Uh, when we say make America great again, we don't say it's perfect. Even the founders said a more perfect union, recognizing that they weren't promising utopia. And, right. and our side, and again, I'm talking, and I don't know your politics necessarily, um, but, but our side seeks to ameliorate its problems, while the other side always has this magical solution to problems, the end to poverty, where we try, where we seek to lessen poverty. And, and so they're always going on these extremes where you need a massive government. You need the, 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 the Green New Deal. Whereas on our side, we just say, you know, let's turn off the light. <laughs> let's let's right. make it just a little bit better. Right. But again, that's, a, that's like, as I was saying before, and Evan captures it in his book, if you want to, you know, do a quick sanity check to say, you know, okay, what's the solution to climate change? Well, it's the Green New Deal. Well, what is that? Well, it's socialism. What's the, what's the, what's the solution to gun violence in America? Well, it's, it's socialism. What's the solution to our education? Uh, disparities between races and cultures and everything. Well, it's socialism. You know, it's the same. It, you know, that's why I say if you want to understand and study those, you have to go back to what's what's the end game and what's the solution from different points. And that's why like, again, I don't even know if we teach that in our in civics or in school or anything like that anymore, um, rather than just touching on the surface and leaving kids confused. And we just lost Evan. Oh, well. Um we can fill that time. So one of the things I'm, I'm always interested in is, you know, we talk about, you know, we the people in order to form a more perfect union. The word tranquility is capitalized. And it's, inter it's interesting when you think about that, what that means. And we are not a tranquil nation, I wouldn't say. We like to have fights all the time about everything, which kind of right. forces us to cooperate. But, you, you know, again, you, you would rather have that fight on social media than have it on the streets. Or, or, you know, or, or physical violence that that's to me, that is tran tranquility is when we, you know, what the kind of peace and prosperity we've been able to keep. Uh, another big term and, and uh, that I was sh shocked when I was doing my own research and studying on different things, but is the word regulate or regulations. And in the 18th century, the, that term was defined as making things regular, just keeping things on like interstate commerce. You know, the laws were laws in U.S. code was up to keep things regular so there weren't one state doing embargoes against another or, or, you know, disrupting trade within our own union or something like that. But now today, regulate means is to draw up regulations to take control over. And the yeah, uh, this is him calling me. Uh, I know he's trying. I'm going to mute you and I'm going to fill time. Are, are you ready? All right. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, no problem. One second. All right. So while while uh, Eric talks to Evan offline as he tries to get logged in, I will uh, I will fill some time. Yeah, I was uh, thinking about the whole concept of stability and, and what it means as a nation to be able to create stability, whether it's through the police or laws and that kind of thing. And yeah, I know that rule of law is interesting in that however you want it to be is how you define rule of law. But rule of law involves having Again, laws that a society agrees on so you can handle things like murder in court. You can adjust how a court operates. You can legislate how police and, and use the executive branch to guide police. But if you just wholesale, and I think Eric's back, if you just wholesale deconstruct the police or if you deconstruct what stability is, I, as a guy that's seen a lot of in, unstable places, there is absolutely no guarantee that you'll get back to a stable platform. You, Even if it sucks, even if it's not the solution you want, it's better, from my experience, to work within the given system to improve it incrementally as opposed to tearing things down. Sometimes you need reform, but grand reform, there's no promise that we ever get back to a place of stability. And, and if anything, you would see... Yeah, you know, the nation potentially break into pieces and smaller pieces, yeah. and historically that doesn't go well. Hey, Eric, welcome back. All right. Hey, uh, he he said he's coming back. I said, hey, just come back on. We'll wrap it up and and, and go from there. He's doing great. Um, I I, I want to plug an article that I got coming out this week because it's uh, based upon these riots. Um, one of the things that I've I put together was 
and again, it comes from the confusion. Every time I'm, I'm, I'm motivated to write an article, it's because of the confusion and, and, and downright misinformation that comes out from the media on a certain point. And, and this one is on understanding the, a difference between, the, I see this argument about, well, most of these protests right now are peaceful. 97, 93% have been peaceful and 7% have not. Um, one, that's not an, it's not an argument that says then the 7% is okay because it's just 7%. But if you really want to understand the different movements that are involved, and I, and I talk about Black Lives Matter, I talk about Antifa, I talked about um, um, even Proud Boys or, or Boogaloo Boys on, on, the, on the right as extremist groups. The, um, one of the things you have to understand is that there are four different levels of participation in these groups. And so at the core are going to be your core leadership and your activists, those two levels. That's a pure, that's a, no, those are the folks actually committing the violence, actually conducting attacks or, you know, or doing, you know, the more nefarious or illegal activities. But much larger than that is a, every group has a support base and larger than that is every group has a sympathetic base. Now they're not, it's not illegal. It's not violent. Um, they may even be, not even witting that, you know, they, they may be unwitting or unwilling or not even understanding that that's, you know, they're providing that sort of support to those groups. Uh, I, 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 and I use that as an example is, is you may be contributing to uh, think, thinking that you're contributing to helping what you see as racial injustice by, by, by do donating money to the legal funds of the folks that are getting arrested at these demonstrations. Well, what you're really doing, and you may not know, is, is understanding where does that money go once it, once it hits that group. You, you, when you read, and it's self-professed by Black Lives Matter and their leadership on their own website, they, they espouse leftist and Marxist principles. So you may not even agree with that, but as long as you agree that that you know you want to do something to end racism, which is a, a just a, you know a just and noble notion, but by doing that, you are all, you have just turned yourself into part of the support base for a, a Marxist leftist groups, which you may not know or agree with. In 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 my book, and sorry about dropping off on you guys, uh -huh. but uh, in 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 my book, in the, in the woke supremacy, I differentiate between the supremacists, who I sometimes call the true believers, mm -hmm. and the enablers, the the enablers of the supremacy. And I give us an example: uh, Bruce Springsteen, who clearly isn't a supremacist. He's clearly not. In fact, as I understand it, and Eric, you would know better than I, typically it's something like 10% of any movement is actually the true believer. So in the Deep South, right. uh, the right. KKK might be about 10%. The Nazis in Nazi Germany were about 10%. The Islamicists right. are, are, right. are about 10%. And the same thing is true of the woke supremacy. But right. it's the other 90% who are often unwitting. And I give the yeah. example of, of Springsteen singing the song Born in the USA. Mm -hmm. and, and he says, got in a little hometown jam, so they put a rifle in my hand, sent me off to a foreign land to go and kill the yellow man. Mm -hmm. right. So he, is, he, he thinks he's fighting American racism. He's putting forth the narrative and the orthodoxy that America is this racist nation that sends its sons and daughters overseas to this godforsaken jungle in order to kill people because of their skin color. Now, that's, that's aiding and abetting the anti-American uh, movement. Right? But Springsteen didn't give that charge, that, 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 uh, that, that charge, even a moment's thought. Because if he had, he would have known that, of course, while the North Vietnamese did, in fact, have yellow skin, so, too, did the South Vietnamese, with whom we were fighting and who we were fighting for. So, clearly, if both sides had yellow skin, then, then it wasn't the race that was the cause of this war. And, and he, he wouldn't have made those horrific charges. So here's a guy who is really trying to do the right thing. Springsteen's the nicest guy in the world. He really has the, 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 the right heart, the good heart. But yet here he is mindlessly supporting the woke supremacy when he thinks he's doing exactly the opposite. I don't know if you saw the story, but Seth Rogen today said some pretty harmful things about 
Israel and Judaism in general. And it's one thing to not believe in any kind of, you know, religion or whatever. God bless. Do what you got to right. do. Right. But, but you know, to come out, and, and for those that don't know, Seth Rogen is Jewish, to come out against something like that, it just becomes more and more shocking. Not to give Israel a pass. They've done a lot of shitty things. But here we are trying to stabilize this region as a nation, as as a world, you know, trying to, you know, we have ties between UAE and Israel for the first time. And what is it, what does he hope to accomplish by this? I mean, not that you could speak for Seth, Evan, but what is going yeah. on? Look, this is answered both ideologically. That's what my first book was about. The Kindergarten of Eden, how the modern liberal thinks was about ideology. You see, every regime, every, and, and I'll call any movement, even itself a regime, has two aspects to it or what it seeks to accomplish. One is the ideology and two is the system, right? The first book was about the ideology and that ex goes a long way towards explaining why the modern liberal will invariably side with evil over good, wrong over right, ugly over beautiful, profane over profound, and failure over success, no matter what the issue is. All right. And, and I give two examples, one being how, how do you look at what went down in Ferguson, Missouri, and decide that Michael Brown was this innocent, gentle giant gunned down in cold blood for no reason, except that the cop was an evil white racist. How do, how do you look at the facts and get it? So, in fact, there's even a plaque honoring Michael Brown in, in Ferguson, Missouri. Right. How do you look at the Middle East? And, and, and I don't think Israel has done such horrible things. I think they've done things they've had to do while surrounded by those who are sworn to their destruction with very minimal uh, margin for error. I think, in fact, quite the opposite. I think I I Israel has been stunningly restrained and stunningly good. If the situation were reversed and it were the Islamicists who, who, who had the, the money and the power and, and the uh, – resources that Israel has in a day, the Jews would be wiped out. So I don't agree that that Israel has done such, such shitty things as, as you said. But systemically, Judaism is antithetical to socialism, right? Socialism, by its definition, hates religion. Imagine no countries, no religions, right? They, a, a, a deep and abiding antipathy for religion is inherent in, in Marxist theory and in socialism. But while they hate some religions a lot, they hate the Jews most of all. Whether it was Hitler and his anti-Semitism, whether it was Soviet Jewry and, and, and the singling out of Soviet Jewry, whether it's the BDS movement today, which seeks to finish Hitler's work by strangling economically the Jews of Israel to death. Mm -hmm. uh, Jew hatred has always been endemic to, to the socialist structure. And the reason is simple. Look at the, look at the five of the Ten Commandments that that have to do with how man interacts with man and every single one of them is antithetical to socialism thou shalt not steal well socialism by its definition is steal all your possessions uh, thou shalt not covet covetous is exactly what socialism is based upon uh, I, I, you'd have to now go into my book because a lot of it refers to to what I said earlier. And would take, but if you look at the Ten Commandments, the five that have to do with how man deals with man, are antithetical to to what uh, socialism stands for. By the way, one of them being one of the key points I make in both books is that modern liberalism, uh, wokeism, is an infantilizing ideology. It actually seeks to return man back to, let, let's say, um, the noble savage. Okay, that's 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 basically what it's based on. Is, is that man man is born morally perfect and then is corrupted by the, the institutions that society created for its own evil purposes, the patriarchal family, the 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 the, the sexist and homophobic church, uh, the xenophobic country. And so if they can eliminate those things and just permanently retard the growth of the child prior to his being corrupted by these institutions, well, the whole point of Judaism is to create the best man, the best adult possible. In fact, one of the highest praise, the praise that, you, that a Jew can give is to call somebody else a mensch. 
Well, if you look back at the children of the 60s, the children of the 60s, the flower children, their enemy was somebody they called the man. Words have meanings. <laughs> I you wanted know. to ask you about this too, because one of the, so look, I, I, I lean neither right nor left. I'm, I'm a complex person like everybody else. And I, I struggle to take the current version of the left seriously. Uh, one, um, they call the president and people like him Nazis, which is clearly not the case. There's, you know, if anything, he he is the anti-fascist. He does not act like a fascist. He's not forcing governments to do what he wants. You know, all these things. Um, I, I don't remember the last time a dictator was impeached. Yeah, exactly. You're welcome to do that. Uh, so, and the Nazi thing is crazy to me because who is putting signs in their storefront to avoid being attacked? It's not because Donald Trump's troops and brown shirts are going. It's, it's the other way around. It's the, So how am I supposed to take... My my friends who are not as ideologically you know challenged on the left, how do I take them seriously? I mean, how do we how do we partner? Because we need all of us to go in at least a generally similar direction. But I I can't I can't look at Joe Biden and Kamala Harris as legitimate candidates when I've seen their track record and what they offer. Uh, is there anything that I can do to help understand like how to communicate with my left leaning friends? Yeah, I've, I've given this really a lot of thought, and I think the best thing that anybody can do, and I think we all need to do it, is uh, buy my book. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, one mistake that our side makes, and, and again, our side, I'm talking about me, not, not you necessarily, is that we expect to be talking to grown-ups, and we know that we are so right, uh, correct, not necessarily in every one of our proscriptions, but in our recognition of what the problems are, what good and evil is, what right and wrong is, what better. And, you know, when, 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 when an artist, when a museum curator puts a toilet bowl in a museum, we're pretty sure that we might not know the difference between, a, a, you know, a, a, a Matisse and, 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 and a Van Gogh. But on the other hand, we know that's a toilet bowl. And, and it's hard to take a leftist museum curator seriously when, when they're putting toilet bowls and calling them art exhibits. Um, I have a program I call Adopt a Democrat. <laughs> and I call it Adopt a Democrat for two reasons. One, we've got to recognize it really is like dealing with children. It's very much like trying to deprogram somebody who's been raised in a cult because they have been raised in, in this cult of indiscriminateness. And if you think that you're going to bully or badger or yell or, or, or even just lay out the facts to, to the other side and they're going to suddenly be deprogrammed, they're just going to revolt. You know, if, if you were raising your child and you made everything a teachable moment, they would they would they would rebel. And so what you have to realize is this is going to be a process. What you have to do is plant a seed today. And then move on and hope that somebody else comes along and waters it. And then somebody, you know, tends to the sprouts. And, and, and it's, it's in like raising a child. It might take 18 years, but you got to start the process. One good thing, and this is something I realized when I attended my first Republican meeting, was it dawned on me as I sat there that this was the first time that I was hearing from a Republican what a Republican believes. Up until then, I had only heard what leftists told me Republicans believed, whether it was my, my, my leftist rabbi, whether it was my leftist college professors, whether it was my leftist colleagues in Hollywood. You have to go out and have the guts to, to introduce your ideas, to just plant them, to, to, because they have so cowed us that we self-ghettoize, all right? We don't present our ideas because we don't want to cause trouble at the, at the Passover table. We, we don't present our ideas because we don't want to lose our jobs in Hollywood. We, now we don't present our ideas because we don't want to get punched in the face by Antifa. But, and we don't present our ideas. But there's a reason that Hitler put the Jews in ghettos before he got to the final solution. And there's a reason that the Democrats in the Old South segregated black and white children on their plantations. And it's because when you segregate, you prevent the people 
who, who, who you have plans for, worse plans for, from disproving your narrative about them by their humanity. If black and white children were allowed to play on, on the plantation, love each other, get to know each other, and that would have been the end of slavery because the narrative of slavery was that blacks were subhuman. Well, the blacks, by being mingling with the whites, would have disproved their humanity, the lie needed to perpetuate slavery. Right? If the Jews were allowed to live amongst the populace in Germany, then they would have disproved the narrative of Jews as vermin that Hitler needed to justify the gas chambers and the ovens. And so when they segregate us by, by uh, YouTube jail or, or, or Facebook jail and um, shadow banning, and we self ghettoize because we don't want to cause trouble, we are halfway to the final solution. They're already dehumanizing us. You know, one of the stories in my book is about the, the late night talk show host, Jimmy Fallon. Yeah. And Jimmy Fallon was adored in Hollywood. I mean, he was just, he was a good enabler of the cause, clearly not a supremacist himself, the way perhaps Stephen Colbert is, the way perhaps Jimmy Kimmel is. He wasn't a supremacist, but he was a supremacist enabler. He knew the narratives and the orthodoxies in his interviews that came out, but he was, and then he had Donald Trump on his show. And the next day, he was reviled by the supremacy. Variety, the, 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 the uber-powerful uh, trade magazine, wrote a hit piece telling how, 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 how he had humanized the enemy. Well, he tussled we his hair. Human. Yeah, I tussled, tussled his hair. His hair. Yeah. And, that, and that humanized, that's the word they used. That's the word the Huffington Post used, that, that he had humanized Trump. In a supremacy, the other must be subhuman. And and I forget what the point was. Well, I, I'm going to I'm going <laughs> to jump I'm going to jump in with that because I watched Jojo Rabbit for the first time last night. I didn't see a right-leaning like commentary. I saw the left. You know, like all the stuff about the jewelry and all that stuff that they did with the book and I'm like, "Oh my god. You know, that's all of this 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 talk about racism and supremacy and all these things like, like this is this goes both ways. You guys, like, you don't like the right, but here you are doing the same damn thing. But it doesn't exist on the right. I mean, where, where, where is it on the right? Certainly. Let, let me let me do it this way. William Buckley made a great point. He said. Every every movement is going to have its crazies. The way that you can tell if the act of the crazies is actually a reflection of the mainstream is the response of the mainstream to the acts of the crazies. Right? You see Joe Biden meeting with Jacob Blake Sr. And, and not a single word of renunciation, not a single word of renunciation about falsely accusing Kavanaugh of, of, of sexual uh, improprieties and worse. Not a single Democrat said... You know, I disagree with Kavanaugh on all his judicial rulings, but but falsely accusing a man of, of rape is a bridge too far for me. You didn't see a single Democrat in the Senate say, you know, I disagree with Donald Trump on every issue, but my constitutional oath makes falsely impeaching the president something I won't do. You may have crazies on the right wing, but there's nobody in talk radio who's supporting them. There's nobody in Congress who's supporting them. In fact, mm -hmm. the anarchists and the crazies on the far right is as much a threat to, to, to mainstream republicanism because they want to destroy the, the world that we love as much as the left wants to destroy the world that we love. And in fact, if you look back prior to Trump, the last two Republican nominees were barely even Republicans. They were rhinos, all right? They, 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 they were the maverick, not the party line guy. And, and they were the one and only person with an R next to their name to support the impeachment scam. Right? Even Trump is not a right winger. Trump's a pragmatist who was adored by the left. He was adored by the left until he ran against them. 
Yeah, he's running on improving schools, uh, getting us out of forever wars, you know, like, uh, uplifting you know people of color. Uh, and these are things that he's done. And it's, it, again, it's crazy, this whole... Uh, By the way, the left doesn't want to uplift people of color. Right. right? If, if, you go, if you go back to Saul Linsky's Rules for Radicals, and Saul Linsky's Rules for Radicals is a very rare manifesto in that it makes no pretense of morality. Uh, you can read Hitler's Mein Kampf, and he's at least thinking that he's advancing morality. He thinks he's making a better world. In the, in the very introduction to Rules for Radicals, Olinsky says the purpose of this book is this, this book is for those who wish to change the world from what it is to what they believe it should be. Well, Hitler right. wanted to change the world from what it is right. to what he believed it to be. It, it was, it's simply a how-to for those who lust for power and have no compunction uh, uh, about how they go about getting it. But, but again, Rules for Radicals in the title itself, it, it, does not, it is not a how to evolve your society into one that you want. It's how to you know, radically change, revolutionize, or just, you know, and therefore you destroying the foundations that you've typically relied upon and building something on top of that. That's, you know, by, by the title itself, it's a revolutionary book. And, and, and by the way, it's written just as much for the next Hitler as it is for, for the democratic yeah. socialist. And, right. and Alinsky goes out of his way in this book, uh, in his book, in Rules for Radicals, to make this clear by paying tribute to the devil in the introduction. He actually pays tribute to the very first radical uh, who, who at least got a little piece of, 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 of the pie for himself. I'm obviously paraphrasing. But and in fact, Alinsky repeatedly compared his book, he called it sort of a prequel uh, to, to Machiavelli's The Prince. Like the prince is, is a manual on how to maintain power at any cost. And Rules for Radicals is how to first get that power no matter what it takes. Mm. Sounds pleasant. <laughs> it's, it is. And oh, and, and so as they don't want to help blacks. One of the Rules for Radicals is he says, it's up to us. Now that's interesting. Who's the us? It's up to us to go in and rub raw the sores of discontent. So they're talking about elitists who have to then go into the black community and not make things better, not alleviate, not ameliorate, but rub raw the sores of discontent. And that's why the news media, for example, never shows black on black crime because that doesn't accomplish their goal. They only show when a white police officer shoots a black victim because the purpose isn't Black Lives Matter. Black lives don't matter. It's rubbing raw the sores of discontent right. because that's one of the rules that will destabilize society, that will see black families more dependent on what I call the master planners. Right? They're, no, they're no longer their master. They have the master planners. And ultimately, they hope leave, leave the black community so discontented they join the violent revolution. Mm -hmm. But yeah. again, when, when you make the when you look at this, the, the realization that if, if you have 10 percent of a movement and only 10 percent is violent or being act, activists or, or whatever to cause that revolution, it's never going to work unless you have that support base, unless you have that sympathetic base ginned up. So rubbing the sores, as Evan describes it, and, and opening that opening those wounds up, that is a critical component for financial support, logistic support, recruitments, um, you know, sympathy, you know, uh, act, you know, activists who are supporting them just even on social media, that, that is a requirement for all those put in place. And so again, it's, it, you know, if you can apply Evan's rules universally, you can apply Saul Linsky's rules in the same way. Yeah. That's the academic answer right there. Right. And, and exactly. And, and any kind of know. scientific <laughs> method, you know, is it, reliably repeatable and repeated by somebody else and right. that's that's exactly. the standard even if that's part yep. of uh, the patriarchy and uh and uh white power to to use scientific method it's also yep. one of the greatest gifts yep. and right. uh, that's something the scientific <laughs> method is is and by the way two and two is is five is racist and i can explain to you 
where where that comes from, where that all comes from. Let me, I, in the book, I give it as an example. It's now claimed by a peer-reviewed, tenured professor that the knife and fork are racist. All right. You know, we laugh at that, but they, they can write a whole paper explaining why. And the reason is this. There are other methods of eating. You can use chopsticks. You can use your fingers. Right? The fact that you choose to eat and fork means that you've made a discriminating choice. Well, the opposite of indiscriminateness is the evil of having discriminated. Right? This, this may be too late in the conversation, uh, uh, so you can get my book and, and find it. But the supreme trait of wokeism, the way they're going to make the perfect world is every other supremacist movement before them said something or somebody was better than everything else. So the Marxists said a class was better than everything else. The Nazi socialists said that a race is better than everything else. The Islamist supremacists said a religion is better than everything else. So what the woke have done in order to, to be different is to say that nothing is better than anything at all. The, the supreme trait, what makes them the supreme supremacists is that they argue that, that, that everything is equally good and equally right and equally true. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know it's equally true. Civil war is horrible. And if you want it, you, you will hate it because people, if you survive it, because war doesn't care about you, people you love, right. things you care about, the things you want will be gone. And you'll only be desperate for it to end. And that's, if that's the direction that folks are trying to create nothing over something, it's, they're not going to like what they get. I, I hope the heck well, they, even, they even don't if they get, get the civil war, there's, there's no way for them to build from there because if nothing's better than anything else, then what do you build? Right. What do you evolve? What do you grow into? <laughs> Which is why I wrote the original book, The Kindergarten of Eden, yeah. how the modern liberal thinks, and point out that progressive is exactly the opposite of what they are. And, and I point this out. There's just a run that's maybe my favorite run in my book. Am I allowed to have a favorite run of my own? Yes. Yes, so you are. I, where I point out that, that the number of times they applaud infantilism and naivete. No. And you go back to, to, to Orwell, who said ignorance is strength. And the Democrats, the modern liberal, believes that ignorance is strength. In fact, ignorance is the key to paradise. And, and you look, and they, they call themselves the children of the 60s. Uh, one of the most iconic songs of the era, and we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. Right? Hillary Clinton wrote a book of philosophy called It Takes a Village, and its subtitle was And Other Lessons Children Teach Us. Time magazine scoured the globe for the most important human being of 2019 and decided it wasn't a scientist, it wasn't a politician or a statesman, it, it wasn't an inventor or a warrior or an artist. It was a 16-year-old petulant child who was repeating the, the narratives and the orthodoxies of the supremacy to see know nothing about the reality yeah well i i can't disagree with that <laughs> that's uh yeah and, and the, another thing that's uh, very supremacist is to think that you understand how to solve someone's problem the black problem the whatever problem without understanding the condition of the people that you're trying to help and to presume that you somehow have an answer that they haven't somehow come up with. That just Not only they, but well, anybody else before them in the entire world. Yeah. You know, that's, 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 that's another reason I explain that they are a supremacy because every socialist who has ever come along has recognized and seen the horrors of the socialists before them, but they always blame not the system, but the ideology. And then they each conjured a new and this time really perfect ideology. And, and that's what the woke have done. Okay, it, it's, it's not the globalism of Hitler that they, were, that they are against. It, it's not uh, even the supremacy. It's that he had the wrong supreme trait. He, he thought it was race, but it's not. It's indiscriminateness. Anything in closing, Eric? No, I'm just yeah. I, I want to just you know put out like this. This is a, a a short read. It's I think you're running at around fifty pages, Evan. A hundred fifty. Okay, hundred fifty. I mean, it, it is it is a very. You know, you know, read, that's a fair. 
mistake. That's a fair mistake on your part because when I sent it to you, it, yeah. it was on the, P, the no, PDF. Yeah. The PDF was yeah. fifty. <laughs> so, but the the you know it is not. It is a very readable book. I mean, it is not full of jargon. It is not full of. Uh, you know, antiquated uh, examples or anecdotes, or, or even super, you know, superfluous academic language that tries to make it make Evans sound like you know somebody who's a highfalutin theorist or anything like that. It is very down to earth. Read, you know, again, and, and it's like his first book, you know, and I've handed it out to, to several of my friends to take a look at it. And you know, some of them will come back and say, you know, I don't agree with this certain principles, but when you get down to okay, what about this, this, and this? It's it really gets to the heart of, of and drives down to the core. So you can argue about the different realities of how you can apply it to. But when you get down to the core, you cannot get around the argument that all of them lead back to this one fundamental piece is that in, in terms of the, the, the solution for everything is a is a socialist answer or, or the answer is is to change our system into a socialist economic system so that we can do all these other cool things after that. Um, that's the piece that that's that's the piece on the draw from his book, and it's not. And like I said, he's not egregious. He's I don't I didn't see any personal attacks on it. It was very well thought of um, and, and a fantastic use. And so that's why it's you're not going to read it just for enjoyment. You're going to read it as a reference. You're going to find yourself going to want to go back to it again and again. And say wait a minute, we now now we are talking about you know again, I go back to climate change or something like that. There was a piece that Evan talked about that now I'm applying to is like, you know what, that just made sense in that one area. You know, I can now apply it to this other area. And that's really the difference between, uh, you know, a good analyst and a great analyst is being able to apply what you've learned to something else. And I'll say this in closing, then I'm going to give you the mic, Evan. Uh, Utopia was a satirical piece. <laughs> stop stop using it as, <laughs> you don't make Irma Baumbach the foundation of your of your whole entire movement she's wonderful she's hilarious but it's satire you know come on uh, Evan go ahead yeah I, there are a number of books out there including right now my, my good friend Dinesh D'Souza has a new book on socialism and it's a very very important book uh, what, what makes mine different is I address the philosophy and I and I tie it to I call the modern world the last hundred years and three things happened almost simultaneously a hundred years ago. One was World War One, which was so devastating and so economic in, 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 as far as human toll goes, as far as property goes, as, as far as uh, riches and treasure go, so devastating, it left that form of governance, uh, rendered it invalid. It was no longer considered acceptable. At that exact moment, two ideologies that had never been tried before burst upon the world stage. One was when socialism, when Marxism went from theory to practice for the first time with the Russian Revolution, and the other was when a still young but now strong America burst onto the world scene as a world power and introduced what I called modern nationalism. And these two ideologies, one of globalism with a central utopian government and one of sovereign border, fixed borders and sovereign people have been warring in one form or another ever since. The ideology has changed time and again on the left. Again, Marxism isn't Leninism, isn't Stalinism, isn't uh, Maoism, isn't uh, Hitlerism, and it isn't democratic socialism. But socialism and nationalism have been at war. And we thought this war was over with the fall of the Soviet Union. right? We thought it was on the ash heap of history, as Ronald Reagan said it should be. We thought it was, as, as, as Francis Fukuyama said, the end of history in that we had found the, the best system of governance for prosperity and, and progress and good health and long life and, uh, pl and plenty. But socialism is back. And while the ideology may be different, the system is the same system that we've been fighting for the past hundred years. 
Everybody can get Woke Supremacy at the Amazon link below. If you want to find out more about Evan, you can go to evansayit.com. All of these things will be in the show notes. Hey, man, thanks again. And I appreciate you taking the time to write this stuff because you're right. It's not easy on a Hollywood career to stand on the right and say, here's where the good stuff is. But I appreciate you coming down and adding to our array of, of people that we have on and helping us to understand some history and some words and and just to you know have a chance to to we all want better information to make our decisions with and I, I think you're helping give us a lens that's exceptionally valuable in terms of trying to know what to do next we got an election coming up in about two months here and um, it's crazy that that we're having these conversations uh, about the things that we're having so thanks for doing it man ne- 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 never thought it would be never thought it would be hey hey guys thanks thanks so much sure thanks Evan thanks Pete